Hello, everyone. I'm just going to give you all a couple of moments to come in. Hope everyone's well who's watching, wherever, wherever you are in the world watching us. A few people trickling in now, wonderful. Okay, so um, hello and welcome to our latest Inform webinar. Uh, my name's Joanna and I'll be hosting in the background um, today. Um, the Inform webinar series has been designed to give you the opportunity to learn about the latest advances in technology from those working in research and manufacturing. We're pleased to be able to showcase the latest collaboration from Tinius Olsen and Imetrum today. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, after the main presentations, um, there'll be opportunity to ask Matthew and Sean whatever questions you may have. But please, please, could you pop these in the Q&A box that you should find at the bottom of your um, screen there. Please try not to put them in the chat box, because if you do, we might lose them if people start um, having a conversation in there. So, so please, anything that goes in the Q&A box, we will do our very best to ask um, by the end of the whole session. So. Without any more from me, I'm going to hand over to uh, Matthew and Sean to uh, get started. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you, Joanna. I appreciate that. Hello and welcome to everybody, um, no matter where you may be. Um, my name is Sean Bird. I'm the technical manager at Tinius Olson. And through a very exciting collaboration, we've been working with Ametrum to bring you the future of extensometry. Um, and it's called the Vector. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass over to Matthew who will open up for us, and then I'll get into more of the information as we move forward. Matthew? Thanks, Sean. Uh, morning, everyone, or well, good afternoon, whatever time it may be with you. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen a moment. As Sean said, I'm from Emetrum. I am the commercial manager for industrial test and measurement. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background about who we are, where we've come from, and lead into the collaboration with Tinius. So without further ado, um, the Metrum has its roots back in the 1980s. It actually started off as a civil engineering project monitoring various bridges and buildings, specifically the second seven crossing and the Humber suspension bridge. Um, it was done using very, very basic kind of video cameras that were available at the time um, and some pretty rough core algorithms. Uh, those algorithms were taken by Dr. Chris Setchell in the 1990s. He is, in fact, still our technical director. Uh, they were really refined during this period, and the, the company was actually spun out uh, as, a, as a university spin out in 2003. So we are a, a, a UK-based company. We're fairly small currently. Uh, whatever date you may be watching this is the 25th of uh, July. That's the one. Uh, we're about 30 people at the moment. Hopefully, by the time you watch this, it's any time in the future, it will be a vastly bigger number than that. Um, we are specialists in precision non-contact measurement. So we, we use video cameras and some clever algorithms to, to track movement uh, using digital image correlation, or DIC, as, uh, as it's quite affectionately known in the industry. Um, as I say, we've got over 20 years of experience and we've got a, a global presence both in terms of customers and, um, and sales partners and um, the kind of industry partners such as Tinius. So uh, a very, very kind of brief split of where our business is. About 30% of it, or 35% of it, sorry, is extensometry in one form or another. About 35% of it is structural health monitoring. We've stayed quite true to our roots and uh, we're very active in that industry as well. And about 30%. So the remainder is uh, sort of complex 3D measurement systems. So instrumentation of things like wind tunnels and rolling roads, that kind of uh, that kind of industry. This is just a very, very brief overview of our global network. So our headquarters are in, <coughs> excuse me, are in the southwest in, in the UK in Bristol. And uh, this is this is most of our sales partners. There's one or two on here that have uh, been added to recently. Uh, that haven't quite made it onto this list yet. Um, we also work with Tinius Olsen and MTS as original equipment providers, and we supply them with uh, non-contact video extensometry as part of a larger system. So first generation products. Um, 
I've been with Metrum since 2015, and I, I've I've been in the commercial role since then. So I'm I'm very happy to talk about these and say they were they were fantastic at the time. They were very very capable products. Um, they were incredibly complicated to use, and they catered to a huge variety of markets and applications. Um, we've been building kind of bespoke measurement heads with integrated cameras and lenses, sometimes lights as well, as you can see in the middle there, since about 2014. Some of them are single camera systems. The, the image on the right is a single camera system with integrated lighting and lens, etc. And the top, uh, top image is actually a dual camera system, as is hopefully fairly obvious from the, from the image. Those work exactly the same way as your eyes. They actually, both cameras cross correlate and they create a 3D measurement volume which hopefully you can see in the, uh, the center left image there. Um, anything within that volume is, is pre-calibrated and obviously it moves wherever you move the head and translate the head. Um, it stays a fixed distance in front of it and, uh, and enables you to measure a, a wide variety of things. Um, we've been working ever since then to try and improve the form and function of these, the way that people interact with them, engage with them, as well as the accuracy and, uh, and um, the kind of um, yeah, just the accuracy and the tolerance to external conditions as well. So that led us to to this product here that you can see. This is our current flagship product. It's called the Mobius. It's a three D measurement system. Uh, we're very pleased with it and we're very proud of it. And uh, it's uh, a big step forwards for us from where we were. And again, this is the kind of tool that would be used to instrument wind tunnels. And we've we've sold a large number of these to people like Formula One teams or aerospace operators, um, usually for wind tunnels. Um, typically, they're measuring something about a metre and a half in all three dimensions, and you'll get micron level accuracy um, with that. So for, for a wind tunnel operator, um, that's, that's hugely beneficial for them. They can see how the car or plane is moving through six degrees of freedom in real time with, uh, with a very nice high capture frequency as well. So that's where we were, where we're going, niche to mainstream. So typically, um, thanks to our kind of the technology that we've been operating in and the way that we have uh, addressed solutions, Emetrum has always been a provider of niche solutions to, to the questions and the applications that nobody else wanted to touch. Um, we're very good at it. And we've done some very, very interesting things because of it. I just thought I'd include up here on the... Uh, on the top left, that is a 0.7 millimeter carbon rod being tested in compression, and we were measuring the uh, the movement of of that carbon rod in in um, both the axial and the compression compressive as it was um, crushed between those big two steel jaws. There, um, tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of movement, but we could accurately detect how much that was moving. Um, Unfortunately, there's not a huge call for that in the industry. It's fantastic that we were able to do it, but uh, it wasn't a particularly mainstream technology. And generally the cost and the complexity of the system and the fact that it was a very, very um, capable system and it could measure almost everything meant that it wasn't suitable for a, a big proportion of the market where a very simple instrument is required. So new technologies within optics and video capture and just technology generally, mobile phones for one, um, have enabled huge improvements to be made to the products. Um, we've been able to massively simplify onboard processing, et cetera, and uh, we're taking huge steps forwards. So at the beginning of 2020, hopefully everybody can remember those days, uh, seems like a long time ago now, we started Project Prometheus. And the aim of this project was to take our core capability and make it much more applicable and attractive to the mainstream market. So we didn't want to lose what we were capable of doing over and above our competitors. We just wanted a larger piece of the market. So like I say, this was really, really a shift towards commoditizing our product. Um, the aim was very, very simple. It was not just the material testing market, it was every market that we operate within and a growing list. We wanted to address a whole raft of measurement challenges throughout the industrial world. The aim was to disrupt every market that we went into um, in terms of our ability to measure things 
uh, and process things. It's, uh, it's quite simple, but uh, quite, a, quite an aggressive one. So the first project, uh, or the first product, sorry, that spun out of Project Prometheus was, uh, was Project Dynamo, and that led to the creation of the product Vector. Um, the sole purpose of this was it was 100% tailored towards material testing. Um, the aim was to rival a clip-on extensometer or a strain gauge in terms of simplicity, in terms of cost, in terms of ease of use, um, as well as maintaining all the advantages of not actually contacting the specimen, which I'm sure Sean will come on to in a moment. Um, we've worked really, really hard over the last two years to actually do this. All of the uh, efforts within the company, there wasn't anything to sell, so we really focused on uh, developing the next phase of our our product portfolio, all of the effort of the company went straight into R&D, and we've all been working on this very, very hard. Uh, we've been working with industrial partners, with design consultants. Uh, we really want this product to, uh, to succeed, um, and we believe it can. Uh, this, the, aim of this, uh, uh, the aim of this has been summed up by a rather cheesy line that I do apologize for. It's not just a better video extensometer, it's just a better extensometer. Um, and like I say, I can't, uh, I can't move on and hand over to Sean without at least acknowledging Tinius Olsen. Um, throughout Dynamo, the, the project that we've been working on to create Vector, Tinius have been invaluable. They really have um, in terms of the A, the market access and B, the input that Sean and Sean particularly, but his colleagues as well, colleagues as well have had in terms of tailoring the product. We designed this product almost entirely in isolation thanks to COVID. We thought it was fantastic and we, we pulled our collective knowledge to where we thought we had a very, very good product. We took it to Sean and, and his colleagues and said, what do you think? Um, how far off are we? Are we close? Um, and Sean and co were able to just add, uh, add details and just put a little bit of a steer on it and make sure that we were going in the correct way. So they've really been instrumental in actually the design and the development of Vector. Um, they're also um, going to manufacture it for us and they are our primary route to market. So they, they you know, we couldn't do it without Tinius. So um, like I say, that's, uh, that's kind of it from me. And I think quite a nice segue for Sean to, to pick up and uh, take on from there. Hopefully. Thank you for that, Matthew. I appreciate it. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll kind of jump in and we'll take it from there. And to everybody out there, again, thank you for joining us today. Very exciting uh, what's going on in today's society of testing. And the vector is come to us. It's the future. It's a technology that we've improved upon, and we are very excited to utilize the technology that's available to us. And as we move forward, I'm sure we'll add even more to it. My name is Sean Bird. I am from Tinia Solson. I am the technical manager. I also work with ASTM and various other uh, testing facilities throughout the world. What is a vector? Well, the vector is a non-contacting extensometer. And what we do know is that there's been other iterations of non-contacting extensometry out in the world, but most of the time it was cost prohibitive. And what we've done is we've taken all the best of these technologies and wrapped them up into a very usable and advanced uh, featured platform. We have auto detection of gauge, it's very large working area. Uh, this particular device has a large field of view. Um, it's volumetric, it's stereoscopic. Um, it just is a, a, a step up in the direction of extensometry, and I'm very excited to bring this to you. Now, what is a vector in, in physics and mathematics? It's the uh, physical quantities that require both magnitude and direction. And, and when we came up with the name, it, it made sense. Um, we're talking about trying to reach something essentially in, in space. And since strain is dimensionless, I thought vector was a good name. And what this does for us, it 
removes the challenges of what the contacting extensometer and even some of the other non-contacting extensometers in the field present. It's a high accuracy, non-contact technique. Basically, you just plug it in, bring up the power and, and away you go. It's very intuitive. This technology was brought to us and worked with uh, the folks at Ametrum through a number of different uh, testing platforms. And we continue to modify and refine the, the technology that we're utilizing on the, the vector extensometer as we move into the society of testing. Now, some of the neat things that this device will do for you is it allow you to do elongation at failure. You can measure strain and complete uh, uh, your testing without having to worry about the, the violent fracture that happens with uh, tensile testing with a contact extensometer. Uh, this also eliminates any introduction of, of stress concentrations onto the, onto the sample. And if anybody out there has ever had to have their extensometer recalibrated or repaired after it was left on to failure, you can put that in your past. Sure, can I just interrupt you ever so quickly? Are you showing slides at the minute because we can't see them this end? Oh, yes. Why is that? Let's take a look here. Bear with me. Can you see the screen now? Not yet. Ah, good golly. Let's try this again. Bear with me. Something's happening. Can you see, see it now? You see some lovely mountains. Okay, so let's get you where I was at. Okay, huh, interesting. It was showing on my side, Joanna. Don't worry. Okay. I think I, I'm pretty sure you got some lovely, <laughs> lovely slides to show us. Didn't want you not realizing. So. And you can see them now. Yes. Perfect. Okay. okay. So this is the information I was talking about, and let's get to where I was at. There we go. All right. So the vector. It's simple. It's quick. It's repeatable. It's, it's a. A definite step in a direction that has not been achieved as of yet, and we believe that we have it. What you're seeing there is a simple mount, very, very quick and concise, goes on in about two to three minutes. And we have to ask ourselves, why do we test? And what is the background behind this? What are we trying to do And when we're testing? And we're trying to ensure the quality. We're testing the properties of the material. The material. Um, and when you test these properties, you want to make sure that we're not having failure in the in in our society. And we we do this also to make informed choices of how to make the material in the end product. When we talk about testing, and we talk about how long this has been going on, and Matthew alluded to it earlier that Chris Setchell and this came out of a academic platform back in the the eighties and nineties. If you stop and think about extensometry, it really hasn't changed that much. The first extensometer, and for those of you who may not have a real big grasp on uh, material science or mechanical testing, in reality, in layman's terms, what we're talking about is a very sophisticated ruler <laughs> that can measure uh, separation or displacement or compression of material. So if you can imagine looking at a ruler that you may have in your near vicinity and looking at a half of a micron, how fine that is, that's what we've achieved. And what you're seeing on your screen is some representation of different type of extensometry that even though it was developed and designed in the late 1800s, it didn't get into the standards until 1950. And so we're talking about 70 years before it actually got into a international standard. So where does that leave us now? What are we looking at? What are we trying to achieve? We know that as technology is intrinsically ahead of everything else, uh, as we apply it to the world of testing, we have to try and get ahead of it a bit, or at least try to keep up. 
And that's where the vector comes in. We know that we can test in static form, which means a typical axial and or transverse uh, platform. Uh, we have tested this in different types of uh, testing equipment. Uh, we can test all different types of material, composites, plastic, polymers, uh, construction equipment, or excuse me, construction materials such as cement, asphalt, uh, and just about anything else you can think of, it's tested. And if it's tested, chances are it's going to need an extensometer. And as you can see here, this is the, the work of years and years of technology and advancements in the testing platforms. How does this thing work? Well, Matt alluded to it a bit. It's a stereoscopic system, very simple mounting. Uh, it's, it doesn't take much to get this into a test frame and to get this up and running. It is compatible with the operational systems of most of the manufacturers of testing equipment. It will lace in either through analog or through digital. Very simple types of mounting. It can either go on landscape or portrait. We can do strain or displacement. Again, we're showing a landscape platform for you. And we're just showing you a simple mount, how it can mount on a boom arm on a larger machine, how quickly you can move it into different positions, how you can stow it away so that it's out of the way as you may be doing different types of testing, or you may want to bring in a different type of peripheral hardware to test. One of the things that we generate from a extensometer and one of the properties that we use for product development is what is known as elongation. And what elongation does for us is it tells us a lot about the particular material, but there's a lot of things that affect elongation. The speed of testing, the specimen geometry, some different heat elements that may be generated, the surface finish of the sample that you're testing, the alignment of the device. So what we've had integrated into the vector is a very quick and concise alignment process with lasers that allows us to get a finite view of the, the sample in the volumetric window that the vector captures. And if you notice at the top and on the right-hand side, you see a tried and tested tinius Olsen extensometer. And it's very robust, very large. But I will tell you that if you test and it, the sample breaks with this on there, it is susceptible to failure and damage or both. With a non-contact extensometry, such as the vector, those issues and concerns are a thing of the past. Testing has a cycle and it doesn't have any one direction. It can go from the product to the testing platform, from the testing to the product platform, and then back to raw material. What can we test with a vector? Well, there's a lot of things we can test. We can do tension tests, compressive tests, bending tests, hardness tests. We can do toughness tests, fatigue tests. And just to kind of get our heads wrapped around what we're thinking about, everybody, for the most part, has been across a bridge. Believe it or not, as you're taking a vehicle across a bridge, you're, you're doing some type of compressive and tension, tension forces as you go across that bridge. And this is just a quick representation. Now, the nice thing about the vector is that we can capture all that. We can capture that without introducing any stress into the, into the product and or the sample. So many things that we've talked about. There's so many things to consider. And as we move into the world of automation, the vector can be utilized in an automated platform, which is robotic and can run 24 seven, reduces the input of human error. Now, when you think about this, 
20 years ago, 90% of extensometer applications were contact. Today, it's about 70%. And as we move forward, we expect that to drop down to about 30 or 20%. And people are going to go to this vector extensometer, which can cover two to three different extensometer platforms, meaning 25 millimeter, 50 millimeter. Uh, it can cover all the way down to about 10 millimeter of samples. The field of view of this particular platform is 200 millimeters. It removes out of plane movement issues because it's volumetric. So we'll get this into the standard. It is currently in the standard, um, but we'll refine that. And we'll do, we'll do more testing as we move forward into different technology, meaning post-processing technology. Well, if you haven't figured it out by now, what I'm talking about is that we're on the cutting edge of technology. I don't have all the answers, but I think between myself and Matthew, and with some of the input from those in attendance today, we can probably get all the answers together from all the resources that we have. I think this is a collective issue and a collective platform that we can utilize to see some of the exciting advents that we've had in the video extensometry arena. So with that, I think I'm going to let you all know that we'll get this information to you through Joanna. If you have any questions that are not answered during this seminar, you can contact myself or Matthew. And this information is in front of you. And I would assume, uh, Joanna, if you could correct me if I'm wrong, that they will be able to have this in a recorded format after the particular webinar. Absolutely, Sean, definitely. All right, I will hold it there. Okay, so does anybody have any questions right now for either Sean or Matthew? Let's have a look, what have we got in here? Okay, so I've got one here from Scott saying, what standard are you referring to? I can take that one. Okay. The standards for strain measurement are typically under ISO 9513 or ASTM E83. Excellent, short and sweet, thank you. <laughs> um, I want to hear from Richard, Richard Skelton. Um, it says here, in testing MEA, does that mean anything to you? It doesn't mean anything to me, I'm afraid. In testing MEA. I think he's talking about testing measurement. Um, I'm not familiar with that acronym. Um, Matthew? No, I'm afraid not. I was uh, making the same assumption you were, Sean, that it was testing measurement. Um, oh, it's come back. In testing metals, here we go. In testing metals, can your system detect contribution of surface grains? Um, perhaps I'd take that one. Um, the, our historic systems can and did. Um, you could certainly use the grain structure of the material to actually um, form a pattern to track with, uh, worked very, very well. Um, because of the field of view, as Sean said, this is about a 200 millimeter field of view. We don't have, um, it, we basically don't have a zoomed, up, zoomed in enough view to actually use the, um, to use granular structure for, for that, I'm afraid. Okay, hopefully that I'm going to kind of piggyback off that if you don't mind, Joanna. Mm. So with most isotropic or homogeneous material, that isn't normally a consideration for elongation, reduction of area, um, a modulus, what we, what we would call um, the 0.2 or 0.5% offset or, or discontinuous yielding, which is normally some of the material properties that you would generate from extensometry. The, the grain and the grain representation is normally done through um, metallography um, or different various types of uh, equipment that is not uh, uh, through video extensometry. Um, there is some capability in some DICs that can do strain and stress mapping. Um, and in our iteration of what we call the tier three uh, for post-processing, we will approach that and address that. 
Okay, hopefully that answers um, both your questions. Richard, whether the first one was part of that, I don't know. So do let us know. Um, if not, come back to us, please. Um, okay, so I've got one here from Rodney. Uh, can you use for elevated temperature testing? Yes, indeed, um, we can do indeed. So this should, um, or it does, um, it, sh it will be used for everything that's common with most temperature chambers. So sort of minus 70 up to about 350 degrees C. Um, it will do higher temperature than that. The, the big consideration with temperatures over and above that, you tend to use clamshell furnaces, is getting a line of sight to your specimen. That's, that's the big consideration. Uh, if you've got line of sight and we can apply some kind of um, temperature resistant marking to it that the vector can lock onto, yes, it will it will track elevated temperature, you know, very high temperature as well. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, one from Andrew. How does this compare with DIC? So this um, this technology is it's not strictly speaking digital image correlation, but it's, it falls under the same general umbrella. So it's basically pattern recognition. Um, it's the same principle. It's just tracking, um, tracking movement of a portion of the specimen by using, by using DIC techniques, basically. It, it is frame by frame, um, recognizing the pattern and tracking it. So Strictly speaking, it's not digital image correlation. That term tends to be reserved to the systems that Sean alluded to, um, where you've got this kind of stress or strain map that looks a little bit like an FEA plot. Um, but this, uh, this is an actual point-to-point -point measurement between, between two points on the specimen. So like I say, it's not strictly speaking DIC, but it's a very, very similar technology. Fabulous, thank you. Um, one from Jay, class B2, or better for tensile modulus? I hope that means something to you. <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> so the, the requirements for ASTM and ISO, ASTM is E83 and ISO is 9513. Um, they're very similar. Uh, the ASTM uses what's known as fixed and relative error. What we have proven that this device is capable of is reaching class B1 and ISO 0.5. Um, so it does meet B2, um, which most uh, aerospace and medical, as far as ASTM is concerned, they have to utilize what's known as class B2 or better to calculate modulus, which this does achieve. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, from someone who's very shy, I won't give their name. Uh, can you please explain how it tests rubber material? Yeah, of course. Um, the big consideration with rubbers and elastomers is actually um, using, a, using a gauge length that is short enough to enable the elongation to go all the way through, sorry, uh, to capture all the elongation before um, it runs out of measurement volume. So as Sean said, the measurement volume on the, the unit that we're talking about is about 200 millimeters. Um, if you start with a 10 millimeter gauge length, um, if the rubber or elastomer is actually stretchy enough, it will track it all the way up through to the, the extent of the field of view. Um, if you have a, um, uh, a, a more elastic elastomer, um, there is actually a, a, a long, uh, sorry, there's a, um, a larger field of view model coming uh, in the near future, which will hopefully address that as well. Um, I've done a lot of testing with this with elastomers to make sure that it is really robust as it's tracking all the way through that uh, that volume. Um, you can get several hundred percent strain on it, even with a with a ten millimeter gauge length before it runs out of runs out of the field of view. Um, but yes, it, you do have to start with quite a small gauge length if you've got a very stretchy specimen. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Next one. Um, what's the sample preparation process? Do we draw dots or lines? So vector will actually recognize. Oh, sorry, sorry, Sean. Oh, you can take that one, yeah. Oh, no worries. Um, so vector will actually work with both, um, depending on the the size of the specimen. Um, the preferred method is to draw a draw a circle, and at the moment we are using um, little templates, and 
we're thinking that actually we'll just make STL files available to people so that should they have a custom gauge length they need to work with and, and access to a 3D printer, they can actually print their own specimen marking kits. Um, we have some that we've designed that uh, we, we've manufactured that uh, are, are very, very good. They're very useful. Um, but yes, a, a circle is ideal because it, um, it allows a really high resolution, really nice, clear um, results to come through. But it will work equally well with lines um, or solid dots as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very flexible system and it will work dynamically with them as well. You can put anything in front of it within reason um, and it will automatically swap into ring mode, dot mode, line mode, whatever it might be. And, uh, and track all the way through. So it's it's a very flexible system. Anything you wanted to add to that, Sean? Or... Yes, I, I, I'll, I'll kind of jump in here. So because there's so many different types of material out there, and when we uh, provide this particular technology to the end user, they may change what they're testing. So we will provide a suite of different type of marking capability devices that will fit what they use. And they may have to try different things because we don't know what everybody's going to test. We don't know what the material is going to be. So it, it sometimes it's going to be trial and error. And we know that from historical testing that there's not one size fits all when it comes to what type of marking you're going to utilize. Uh, we do know that uh, circles at this current point have been very robust. Uh, we know that uh, dots and lines are what's used in the industry. So that is going to be and is available. Um, and then some of the even more advanced testing will introduce some different types of uh, marking uh, technologies. Okay, fantastic. So another one from Andrew. Uh, what is the maximum frequency that you can undertake fatigue tests and maintain control? So um, the, the tier one module that we're talking about at the moment, uh, that has a sample rate of 100 hertz. So I wouldn't um, advise testing more than a, a you know, single integer number of hertz um, on a fatigue frame and trying to control from it. But certainly, you know, anything less than one hertz, it, it will control on that absolutely fine. And we have done so. Um, Above that, again, there is a high speed version that we're working on at the moment, um, and that should be able to control um, several hundred hertz. We're, we're aiming for, for kilohertz sampling frequency, so there will be, a, there will be an answer for dynamic testing control uh, question. Excellent, thank you. Um, next one is price level compared to grips. I'm Sorry, price level compared to grips? Grips. <laughs> That's okay. what it says. Okay, so it, it, what we've done is we've made this approachable to the majority of testing platforms in societies, meaning third-party test labs, uh, captive test labs, um, academics, et cetera. We have come at this uh, with that knowledge, um, being a testing machine manufacturer, we're pretty... Uh, open to, excuse me, let me back this in. We're pretty knowledgeable what the uh, what the price point is in in the society, and um, to put it out there uh, for everybody to know uh, because this is coming to market very shortly. What we're looking at is with the tier one, which is an axial extensometer. We're looking at about nine thousand dollars with an analog interface. Um, so just to throw that out there, um, you can put translate that to pounds or or uh, yuan, RMB, wherever you may be, but it's about $9,000. Um, now, the, the good news about that is, is that in comparison to a clip-on extensometer with a interfacing module, that's about um, maybe 10 or 20% more than what the, the industry charges now. But the, the size of the field of view would allow you to do two, three, maybe even four extensometers with a single vector unit. So the return on investment, which is probably what the folks are thinking about, is is a no-brainer. It's a, it's simple and quick, as far as I'm concerned. And the the other beauty is, as I stated, is anyone who's run a lab or been in lab environments with a optical non-contact extensometer, it will never break 
on the sample ever. So you don't have to worry about having to recalibrate it or repair it. Sure, excellent, thank you. Um, is this a system that can be mounted on most universal test frames? Yes, yes, indeed. So a huge amount of work has gone into the mounting uh, of Vector to make sure that it is as universal as possible. So um, yeah, absolutely. Um, standard uh, universal test frames, most of them have T-slots. So we, we tend to interface with them. If there aren't T-slots, that's another question, but not insurmountable. But yes. Super. I'll jump in there a little bit, Matthew. So the current platform and mounting that we have is also uh, adaptable to hydraulic frames. Uh, it'll use the same basic hardware um, with adapter kits to go onto the hydraulic frame. So it we will encompass pretty much about 90 to 95% of the current platforms that are out there. And then we could adapt as needed if it was a special application, i.e. a horizontal frame, robotics, automated systems, et cetera. Okay, um, next question. How would we be able to calibrate the system considering UK AS requirements? I can take that one. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> okay, so uh, currently uh, both the, the requirements for ISO uh, 9513 and ASTM EA are, as we discussed earlier, the class and what it must meet. It must meet resolution, it must meet uh, fixed or relative error or what's known as bias if it's ISO. And you would use a, excuse me, you would use a calibrator um, or a standard that has at least a four to one TUR, which is known as a test uncertainty ratio or test, um, or um, you could utilize uh, an inframometer, but there's not a whole lot of people out there that have inframometers. Um, these have been calibrated uh, in situ. You would then put your virtual um, strain lines onto a calibration device and then measure the displacement as it travels through uh, the particular data points that you're required to capture. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, do you need to paint metallic specimens to enable tracking? No, no, it's... Um... We use a uh, we use a specialist. Well, it's not particularly specialist pen, but we use a pen that works well um, with the the filters and cameras that are in Vector. It's very very highly reflective to Vector, um, but no, you don't need to prepare the specimen in any other way. Fabulous, thank you. Um, hello, Samir here from my from Delhi. Um, the latest model you showed did not have any visible cameras in the CAD. What technology is the current X sensometer based on, if not DIC? So there are uh, there are indeed cameras in there, and this is what I was alluding to uh, with my part of the presentation. So in, uh, improvements to um, camera and lens technology means that we can actually use much, much smaller cameras and much smaller lenses. And because we're calibrating this 3D volume where they're cross-correlating, uh, it means that we can use very, very um, easily accessible lenses without having the um, historic problems that you would have with a single camera and that style of lens in the outer plane movement. So as I get closer to the camera on my laptop, uh, things appear larger. Um, because we're using two cameras, that problem goes away. Um, so we're actually using very, very small, almost mobile phone style cameras in there um, and just running them uh, very, very carefully. Okay, thank you. Um, have your systems been validated on biological tissues, um, for example, tendons in published studies? No, but I'd very much like to have that conversation. So please do drop me an email. Um, I, I'm very, very keen to have that conversation with, with anyone. Unfortunately, it's, it, there was no name left there, but so hopefully if you're still listening, um, please do get in touch. Super. Um, what are the limitations with high temperature strain elongation measurements where the sample shines? Are they similar to old VEM or any possible improvements? Okay, so I think that's referring to black body radiation where um, as the specimen reaches a certain temperature, it starts to emit infrared radiation. Um, if that's the case, it is vastly improved over the old VEM system. Uh, there's an awful lot of control in the lighting in Vector, which eliminates a lot of um, 
you know, black body radiation eliminates that completely. It also eliminates um, reflective shine, if that was what you were referring to. Um, we, we've cut all of that out. So historically, video-based systems are very, very susceptible to changing ambient light conditions. This eliminates all of that. So yeah, very, very much more robust than the old BEM systems. Super. And by the way, they did say thank you for your answers and a great presentation, which is lovely. We do our best. <laughs> <laughs> um, one from Lucy. Uh, what would the lead time for delivery be on the vector ensembles out of interest? So the first deliveries are going out the door at the beginning of October. It's a first come first serve basis. Uh, we're hoping there's going to be somewhat of a, uh, a Black Friday rush on this. <laughs> um, but yes, it's, it's going to be stock dependent. Like everyone, we're seeing impacts of the global supply chain issue. And we're, we're actually, for from October, we're actually looking okay. So depending on when you get your order in, um, typical lead time once we're up and running, once it's launched, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a matter of weeks rather than months. Fantastic. There you go, Lucy, get your order in quick. <laughs> um, and following up on that one, one from Max was, so is this already commercially available? So we're saying October, is that correct? It is yeah. indeed October, yeah. Okay, so that's, there's two in one there, super. Um, uh, another one here. What are the limitations with high temperature strain? Oh, I said that one, haven't I? Big pardon. No worries. Okay. Missed that one there. Um, can you use it for polymer testing? I think you did mention this just now with the rubbers. And yes, so um, you can indeed use it for polymers. Um, the big consideration is um, how the appearance changes throughout the test. So, and it's very very simple. It just depends which pen you use. If you've got something that strain whitens an awful lot, um, use a black pen. It, it, it is genuinely as simple as that. Um, I've got some specimens I was testing this morning and I was finding that my uh, normal work marking solution wasn't working. Change to a black pen, problem goes away and it tracks beautifully. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna dovetail in on a little bit of that. So to think back about what we were talking about earlier, because we have a suite of different marking uh, platforms available and we don't know what people are going to be testing, it's not uncommon for a, a lab in society to test metals, to test polymers, to te test uh, uh, composites, all in the same lab, all on the same frame. So what one type of marking solution may work on metal may not work on, uh, on a polymer and vice versa. Okay. Um, I've got a question to follow up here from Samir. Uh, what about the use for samples in a water slash saline bath? So with, uh, with that, there are some considerations. Uh, obviously the glass and the, uh, the liquid that it's containing will have different refraction levels. So you would have to take, you would have to take care in your setup, um, but there's no reason with correct setup making, um, say this um, as long as your vector x insometer is perpendicular to the, the glass and the liquid within it you should minimize any refractive um, issues so actually it should be absolutely fine i would double check it with um, we have a validation tool built into the module so it would be a very very quick and easy thing to check that you were actually aligned with the saline bath and the window at the front what would concern me is a um, a, a, a conical or a round um, saline bath because of the curved glass. I think that that could potentially have an impact if you if you didn't have a perfect setup. Right, and I, I think also Matthew, um, thinking of that, you you know the the design of this was not uh, in particular for that particular type of testing. However, just as stated earlier, we don't know exactly how people are going to utilize this particular testing platform. I would then tell you that if you're going to try this um, in a liquid, that you could do elongation after fracture, if that's what you're going to uh, try to achieve. Um, and you could compare a physical elongation to what you, you captured with the, the vector unit. Um, so that, that's just my two cents on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one here from Scott. Um, how responsive is the vector to testing frequency? If I'm testing at 60 hertz, can I see real-time strain or, or measurement? 
Hi, Scott. Nice to hear from you. Um, hopefully, uh, I, I guess you're talking about um, dynamic cyclic testing. Um, you, you would, um, it, you're testing at a hundred, sorry, we're measuring at a hundred Hertz. Um, you struggle to pick up all of them testing at that speed. If you're cycling your specimen, that would be one for the high temp, uh, sorry, the, um, high speed version, uh, coming shortly. He was asking about 60 Hertz. Does that make a, a, a big difference? Uh, no, if, if he's cycling the specimen at 60 Hertz and we're only measuring at hundred Hertz, you're sort of going to get one and a half points per cycle so you're you're, you're not going to get a very smooth curve you just get a sort of a jagged noisy nastiness <laughs> just because of the speed um like i say the high the high speed version that'll answer that absolutely no trouble at all super thank you um another one from richard who, who was our question at the beginning um in a large grained materials the individual contributions will be different thus affecting young's modulus I see. Okay. So almost discontinuous yielding. Um, right. Okay. So this, this will behave basically just like a clip. So it's just going to measure the difference between those two points. And if there is uh, almost fractures or um, individual grain boundary breakdown, you might just see a jump, but it will track that all the way through failure. Um, it will, like I say, it will just give you a percentage strain between those two points. Um, regardless almost of the mechanical breakdown of the specimen. If it's, if it's continuous, it's nice and smooth, absolutely fine, not a problem at all. If it's quite jerky and jumpy with that kind of individual grain breakdown, again, it will track it all the way through um, because uh, the movement, relatively speaking, is very, very small to vector, but it will detect it. Um, so like I say, it will behave just like a clip on in that instance. Thank you. Um, is there a working distance limit? Yes, so there's about a hundred millimeters from the front to the rear of the working volume. So we're talking a minimum volume of about 250 meters, sorry, 250 millimeters to 350 millimeters. Anywhere within that volume, um, Vector will, will measure quite happily. So it massively reduces the setup time. So you, you've got a very, very tolerant um, instrument that you could set up, like I say, within a quite a working distance and it will just work. Right, so also just, just to make that clear to the folks out there, I think what the, the person asking the question was also trying to achieve is, what is the distance from the front of the lens to the target? And what we normally try to do is be at about 300 millimeters. Um, what Matthew is uh, expounding on is that even if it was back from 300 millimeters it, it, yeah, at closer to you at 250 millimeters and then maybe another 50 millimeters on the other side of that point reference. Would, so from 350 to 250 with the sweet spot at 300, um, because it's volumetric, uh, you can move to the left or right of that point of contact and you still have capture with no out of plane movement issues. Okay, thank you. Um, how can the readouts from the unit be synced with load readings from test frames? So Vector will output uh, an analog signal. It can be calibrated over any range that Vector is capable of measuring, so pretty enormous. Um, and you can actually output a 0 to 10 volt analog signal and either interface it with a signal interface box that Sean was alluding to earlier and plug it in as a digital signal to a Tinius Solson test frame. Um, or you can plug it straight into um, a, a number of different manufacturers' test frames that are capable of reading in that signal as an analog signal. Um, so yes, it, yes, it can be done. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Right. So just to, uh, also to dovetail off of Matthew. So remember that this is uh, the machine that you're testing on doesn't know that it's a clip-on or optical extensometer. That it has no idea. So as long as you're feeding a a strain signal or a displacement signal into the frame, it can come in on, as, as Matthew was talking about, on an analog platform or a digital platform, depending upon what your requirements are, or both. It wouldn't be uncommon for this to be sold to a facility where they might use it as an analog device on one machine and then move it over to another machine and use the digital input. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. 
Um, it's one directly um, for Sean here, being a special request, Sean. Um, what do you think about testing innovation in the future? It's a quite a big question, bearing in mind we haven't got that long left. Well, <laughs> yeah, we only have five <laughs> minutes. Um, what I've seen is over the years, I've been doing this for 30 plus years, is the, the change of the ability of people to want to try a new technology. Um, we've always been in that soft, comfortable area of utilizing what was currently out in the market. And the DIC and the optical or uh, video extensometry pushed that envelope. What I see is with this platform and probably others, as, as we know, competition will try to follow us, is that we're going to see um, biaxial extensometry, which we do know, um, high-speed extensometry, which we do know, and it'll all be in this particular uh, region, which will be non-contacting extensometry. That is where we're at and where we're headed as we move forward in the advent of technology. We will also see, I, I'm going to just go out on a limb here, utilizing this type of technology to run automated, hands-off, 24-7, um, in different automated facilities with robotics. Um, and we do know that that is now part of what we get asked about a lot at Tinius Olson. And we know that that is going to be also a big proponent um, of the testing field saying we want to use this without human um, interfacing, essentially. Okay, so bear in mind, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, uh, as quick as you can with these ones, please. Um, one from Leanne. Is this applicable for ISO 37 and ASTM 412? Yes, indeed. So um, rubber testing. Yes, indeed. It, it can do indeed. Um, again, high elongation. Big consideration is trying to make your gauge length either small enough so that it breaks before the um, marks exceed the 200 millimeter field of view or making sure you've got an elastomer that isn't stretchy enough to exceed the 200 millimeter field of view. Fashion, thank you. Another one from Leanne, what is the maximum extension available for these methods? Uh, it totally depends on machine setup, grip separation. Um, we've had, uh, I think I got 800% out of it once with a very, very careful setup, 10 millimeter gauge length. Um, I, got, I got hundreds of percent out of it um, before it um, exceeded the field of view. Um, but I'm testing um elastomers that will go to several thousand percent okay thank you very much another one from richard how does your system cope with dynamic strain aging uh jerky flow when in strain control interesting one um it's um yeah again it's it's not too bad it's comparable to a clip-on it's it's very very comparable to a clip-on uh, we've done a lot of back-to-back -back testing with um, ISO 6892 to make sure that it does behave itself um, within that. So within the, uh, the update rate of 100 hertz, um, testing it to uh, 0 0.0025 millimeters per millimeter per minute, uh, it, it does behave itself. Um, with regards to the sort of almost strain hardening, um, yeah, absolutely fine. Because it's non-contact, there's there's kind of no real implication. It will just almost mercilessly measure the distance between those two points and just output it as a strain. Um, it it almost doesn't care that it strain hardens. Okay, thank you. Um, is your equipment only suitable for measurement on in air, or would it be able to work, for instance, in a heavy liquid metal? It's an interesting one. Uh, I'm going to say probably not a heavy liquid metal because I'm, and this is a, an assumption that uh, that's not uh, translucent. Um, oh, sorry, transparent. Um, so I presume being opaque, it, it can't see through it. So, but that is an assumption. If I'm wrong, please correct me. So it's like one to test. <laughs> um, what are the kinds of technical supports available? Are there units for trial or rental that can be provided, for example? I'm going to defer that one to Sean, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, currently, uh, Tenney Solson has been in business for about 142 years. We have a uh, dedicated help desk um, for all our products that we release. Um, we will have, this is pretty much plug and play. And because of the cost point, 
if it if it's in the field and needs replaced, it's a it would be a quick turnaround. There's not a lot to repair on these things because they're non-contact. Uh, the as far as rental and or presentation, depending upon where you're at, you may be able to just go to a show, or you may have a a person come to your facility and give a presentation there. Um, if you'd like to purchase one, um, you can contact me directly um, or contact Matthew directly, and then he will he and I will work together on that. Um, perhaps um, if you know some shows that you may be attending um, in, in the, over the coming months, you could let me know and I can pop that out in an email to everybody. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, how are we doing? Are we okay for a couple more? I'm okay, Matthew. Yes, indeed. I'm absolutely fine. I'm trying to answer some in the, in the um, comments section or Q&A as well. That's so. great. I'm sure I thought someone disappearing before my eyes. Um, Wonderful. So what have we got here? Um, is it possible to directly output, I'm assuming it's press-ons ratio, but I could be wrong. Forgive me if I've said his name wrong. Can you ask the question yet again? Is it, oh, you can make me say it twice. Is it possible to directly output press-ons ratio? Oh, um, the, the answer to that, Poisson's ratio is a, a calculation that's based upon axial and transverse. And um, we, we can do that. That'll be our next iteration that'll be released. My guess is probably towards the end of the year going into 2023. This particular platform is for Axial only. Um, the next platform, which we do have uh, uh, in place and have been testing on, does Poisson's ratio. So the answer is yes. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, another one from Leanne, what material industry are ISO 9513 and E83 used for? Primarily metal. There we go. Excellent. That's a nice, easy one. Um, Matthew's answering that one. Um, who calibrates it to ISO 17025 requirements, uh, measurement uncertainties, etc., where it is performed on our site, and what is the cost? <laughs> That's a huge question. So just to kind of make some clarity, ISO 17025 is a requirement under ILAC. And what that means is that you have to be accredited under ISO 17025 to do a calibration of a device that's uh, being utilized in a testing platform. So whoever you have calibrating your equipment, their prices can vary. Um, so to, I can't answer what it would be wherever you may be. Um, a typical calibration on a Extensometer can range anywhere from three hundred to three thousand dollars, depending upon the different points of calibration that you request. Okay, that's a contact me for further information question. I think Jay, um, and one last one: How does it work on high elongation materials? You might have answered this one in, in somewhere along the line. Oh, you still need to Matthew, sorry, you're moving. sorry. That, sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, indeed. So I, I've been testing it with materials that uh, elongate a couple of thousand percent. Um, again, it's it's the gauge length consideration. There will be a, um, a larger field of view version coming next year, which will uh, more completely address the high elongation um, question. But yes, you can certainly get a good couple of hundred percent out of this module with quite short gauge lengths. Um, I've not actually had it fail. So I've not had it lose tracking as such um, on a specimen. It's always run out of field of view. So if, obviously if the, if the cameras can't see it, then, uh, then it's got nothing to measure from. And that's been the problem I've had is, is that 200 millimeter field of view. As long as your final length is less than 200 millimeters, you're absolutely fine. Um, but that's the big consideration. Okay. Fantastic. I think that's all the questions done. Um, uh, so really, other than to say thank you very much indeed, both of you, um, for a really good presentation and, and really thorough questions there. You were, you were put, on, put on your paces, definitely. Um, um, I will say to those who are watching now, there may have been a couple of people who had troubles with their links. So um, I'm going to do the, the um, send out in two stages. I'm going to let people be able to watch this on demand as soon as they possibly can. 
but it will also be put on our website in a couple of days as well. But everyone will have the link to see it as soon as it's downloaded and, and uploaded again on, a, on another site, just for those people who are, might have been disappointed. I have no idea what happened there, so forgive me. Um, but you had a good a good number of people there. Otherwise, can you imagine how many questions you'd have had if everybody had showed up? That would have been a nightmare. So um, again, chaps, thanks so much. Um, uh, have a have a wonderful rest of your day and um, please say do send over any information about where you're going to be um, showcasing um, this so I can make sure everybody has all the information they need. Perfect. Thank, you. Do indeed. thank you very much. Right. Thank Thanks you very much indeed. Time. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.